very much. <clears throat> I'm sorry I'm, I'm losing my voice just a little bit. Uh, you'll have to bear with me. I, Candace, I wish I would known I could put my pictures up there. Um, two and a half weeks ago, I became a grandfather for the tenth time, a uh, new grandson, so I wish I could have done that. But I, I want to thank you for your work and for your presentation that you made. Um, you guys know this is my 39th year in perfusion, and there have been lots of changes and lots of things that have gone on during that time, but the only way we can progress as patient caregivers, and uh, you're going to hear me talk about that, uh, this has been a great profession, and it will be for another two and a half or three years for me, but our primary concern is our patients and how and, and, and uh, the dedication and, and what we put into how we care for them. And so as we talk about this sort of a little bit of a controversy or, or uh, we talk about the, this variability that we all use in myocardial protection, uh, Al Stammers gave a great presentation at uh, the Academy. In the literature over the last 50 years, there were just about 30 uh, shy less than 2,000 different cardioplegia formulations in the literature. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but whatever you do, you need to measure it. So for us, we continue as a, as a, a, a patient care provider for you guys to grow. Uh, we're now in many teaching hospitals, many more procedures, and why? What have you, you heard Candace talked about their protocol and that protocol is different for each patient, okay? And there are a lot of places that don't just have that protocol. They have Del Nido for some, they have Custodial for some, they have four to one for some, and you as a clinician have to have the flexibility because things don't always go as they should to be able to change between one or the other. Well, the MPS can certainly allow you to do that. And if you don't use single dose at all, you can certainly, your surgeon can be hands-free hooking up the antegrade and the retrograde without any problem. I'm going to step back a little bit. I want you guys to read this with me because sometimes I think we get caught up in some of the other things and lose a little perspective. The objective of every operation is to be a perfect anatomic result and avoidance or limitation of intraoperative damage in pursuit of this goal. Two prerequisites to accomplish these objectives are adequate visualiz excuse me, visualization for the surgical precision and the use of cardioprotective techniques that exclude intraoperative damage that can nullify the immediate and long-term benefits of the surgical correction. Cardiac damage from inadequate myocardial protection leading to myocardial dysfunction can prolong the hospital stay and cost and all that sort of thing. Quick question, I'm gonna ask this about four times during, the, during this talk. How many of you actually go to the ICU and see the outcome of what you just did? Great, that's fantastic. Everybody's focusing on the juice. Cardioplegia methodologies have centered around the solutions. And although these are important, the strategies must be developed to ensure that all cardiac regions are protected. Evaluation of safety must show that muscle damage is structurally avoided and enzyme leak is minimal. How many of you go to the ICU and you look at the inotrope score, you look at the inotropes, you look at the troponin eyes, you look at the CKMBs. Because those tell the tale. One of the things that about Del Nido, and Dr. Del Nido is a wonderful longtime friend of mine, in children we give it antigrade. It's easy, they have no coronary disease, there are no issues with giving an antigrade. In adult patient population, Almost every one of our patients have some form of atherosclerotic load. Their heart is probably has some geometric changes due to myocardial infarction or 
to valvular disease, hypertrophy or dilatation. So with that, immediately we know the distribution has been altered. So those things, again, going back, measure what you do. Have flexibility in what you do. And this is one of our own. This is uh, the editor of uh, the Perfusion Journal. Cardioprotective strategies and methodologies must be versatile enough to tailor the management to the patient and not the patient to our management. It's exactly what Candace just talked about and then showed you results in a very acutely uh, morbid group of patient populations. So here's the controversy. We could stop here and spend the rest of our time on this slide. So we give one to one, we give two to one, we give four to one, we give eight to one. If some of us give variable ratio, some of us give microplegia. But anytime you have the one right there, why is the one there? The one is there so you can get the drugs and mix it with the blood, okay? There's no need for that. Sometimes we use crystalloid cardioplegia. When I started back in 79, most cardioplegia was crystalloid. Today, the majority of it is blood. Why? We have 40 years worth of data that tells us that when we do cross clamp times greater than 90 minutes and ejection fractions less than 30%, that they recover and do better with blood. We have single dose Del Nido. We have modified Del Nido, which I'll talk about. HTK, these are all very good solutions and in the hands of very talented people, they work very well. But do you, or is it a one size fits all kind of thought process? Some people give antigrade, some people give just retrograde, some integrate both. Cold, tepid, warm. We don't see that much warm anymore. Delivery pressures and flows. I've done this survey at this meeting before and talked to other people. Do you flow the same, have the same pressure flow relationship in, in a hypertrophied heart with a gradient across the aortic valve of 100 millimeters of mercury as you do in a normal ventricle? You shouldn't. The cardioplegia is not going to get there. And if you're only given one dose, it's got to get there. Delivery volumes and ischemic times. You, if we did a poll right now, there, we would be have so many hands going up. What's right and wrong? I don't know if we know right or wrong, but whatever you do, you need to measure it. And you need to understand it. But here's the key. Do we really have to choose one or the other? Or do we have enough clinical intuitiveness and do we have enough evidence base out there to integrate the best of any of these strategies to provide optimal pr protection? And here's one thing that I keep talking about and it will, it will become a centerpiece before too long, early recovery of metabolism and function. Because when the heart, when you take the clamp off and the heart metabolically works better and has better function, they spend less time in the ICU, less time in the hospital, and they go home. Less time in the ICU is measured in hours, and that's usually in thousands of dollars. And time in the ICU, in, a, in a hospital is thousands of dollars. Myocardial protection is a team sport. How many of you have a timeout before every case? Should see every hand. When you have that timeout, I have a question for you. Do you talk about which method is best for the patient? Or does the surgeon say, all right, we're going to give custodial. We're going to give Del Nido. And that's it. There's no more discussion. Or do you not? You have the chart. You've seen the history. If you look at their disease pathology and they have a previous MI or hypertrophy, is it not appropriate to say, is a leader enough? Do we need to give both antigrade and retrograde? If you're doing a conventional sternotomy or mini approach, if you're doing a mini approach, chances are he's going to see very little of the heart, only the aortic valve and proximal aorta or the mitral valve. Okay? This is something you guys need to talk about. You know, what about the technical repair that's needed? 
He says, well, we're going to do a mini mitral. Well, he's done under 20 of them, and he thinks you're going to give one dose and be done in 60 minutes. Well, if he can't do an open one, open one in 60 minutes, he's not going to do a mini mitral in 60 minutes. But these are questions that as we're part of the team. What we do, our action or interaction affects the outcome. What about our expected cross clamp time? The ventricular function, if they have poor function, you got certainly have less margin of error. Is this not a discussion that as one of the key team, team members that you cannot have with your surgeon and talk about that? Level of atherosclerotic disease, pulmonary disease, all of these things affect the warming of the heart after the heart is cross clamped. If you're running your vent at 200 mils a minute in 10 minutes, that's two liters of warm blood. I'll show you. How do you assess whatever you do? Four to one, Del Nido custodial. How do you assess what you do? I mean, we don't do this much anymore. We used to a lot draw a coronary sinus, uh, get the PA to draw a coronary sinus uh, uh, gas. ECG, ECG, especially in the more complex procedures, procedures where we put them in a thoracotomy, do many procedures, move the EKGs around, they're not really always that accurate. Ischemic time, ischemic time is a really good barometer. But here's some more that are in your wheelhouse. Most all of us, how many of you in a typical case, your, your anesthesiologist puts down esophageal temp probe. The heart's sitting right on it. In 45 minutes, if it's reading that temperature right there, that's the temperature of the heart, because the heart's sitting on it. Transesophageal echo. If you're doing many procedures, even if you're doing open procedures, have the anesthesiologist turn that, that screen toward you, because if you see the heart moving like this, activity is occurring. It may not, it may be flat on the EKG. Those are two good methodologies, and I'll tell you what this represents here. We've done, in several centers now, we've done blinded tests where we use a single dose uh, Del Nido. These were all gathered where we gave an anagrade of 500, of, of 1,000. We gave retrograde of 500. And the myocardial temp was under 11 degrees, usually around 10 to 10 and a half degrees. We put a, we put a, a, a temp probe in the anterior septum and the posterior septum. And these were the temperatures that we read at these particular time frames. And you would, not surprising to you that the heart is back to its room temperature in about 20, 25 minutes. It's that way with intermittent cardioplegia. And then it continued to warm up till we got here at 60 minutes. Now I can tell you, every one of these hearts had no activity at 60 minutes because pharmacologically we had blocked the sodium channels with the lidocaine as Candace so eloquently explained. It lasts about 60 to 80 minutes. And we use magnesium to block the fast and the slow channels. But just because the heart is stopped doesn't mean it's protected. You need to know that. That's why they have an assessment protocol. That's why we all should have an assessment protocol. Is the metabolic environment adequate to prevent damage at the myocyte and endothelium? When I showed the surgeons this data right here, the answer to that last question was quickly no. And very quickly, these guys began to redose at about 60 minutes comfort, whatever you want to call it. So here's, here's the, the, the fallacy when I read Del Nido. So we'll do this just for practice on one, the first one. So how many of you deliver Del Nido at one to four? Four to one, eight to one, all blood. There we go. That's one variable with four different answers. Some of you alter the drug concentrations. What is the correct dose if we were to ask how many give just a liter? 
A liter and a half. How many give 15 mils per liter? Or greater than two liters? And the thing about it is, if you stop and think about the last three Del Nido cases you did, chances are all three of them were not the same. That what was the rationale for the change? Is it just because? Do we have, or did we talk about those elements that I mentioned two slides ago that impacted why we changed? Do you give it antegrade or retrograde or combined? Integrate and retrograde. We certainly see this a lot more. Why? Because the people have traversed the learning curve, and when you have myocardial dysfunction after you take the clamp off or you have a right heart injury, you don't do this anymore. You do that. Do you redose at 45 to 60 minutes? How many redose at 45 to 60 minutes? Okay. How many redose at 60 minutes? How many redose at 60 to 75 minutes? How many redose at 75 to 90 minutes? Guess what? What did you all call it? So when you read an article, which one of these, if this is two to the seventh, eighth power, which one of these variables are different in their practice versus yours? Not to mention patient selection or patient acuity. Here's Del Nido right here, one to four, a liter and a half dose, four to one, all blood. Look at the drugs, exactly the same. What's the difference? Water. The magic's not in the water. The magic's in the drugs. Here's an example, small group. This was published in, in JET just a few months ago. Micro Del Nido versus Del Nido. Extubation time, ICU stay, hemodilution, transfusion, ultrafiltration. The magic's not in the water. Now, I'm going to talk about this slide just for a second. This is not exactly micro Del Nido, this is KBC. But the reason why it says micro, I got these slides from the chief of cardiac surgery in, in London yesterday because he didn't have the chance to call Candace and Dr. Cooper and get permission to put KBC up here. So he used Micro Del Nido, but this is actually KBC. This is their first 41 cases. They've now done close to 300. In Canada, the KBC method is being used in St. John's, Newfoundland, in St. John, New Brunswick, the two centers in Montreal. Dr. Tyrone David and his group are using it in um, uh, Toronto and uh, Anson Chung and his group out in Vancouver. Not for all cases, but the cases they want to do single dose. So all of these 41 were some valvular combined procedure, a type A section re uh, dissection repair, okay? All of them are minimally invasive robotic procedures. The first case was a 54-year-old male university professor with a bicuspid valve and AI, they had a normal root and a normal CT. They couldn't use a Percival valve because his annulus was too large. They were cross-clamped two hours and 23 minutes, gave an initial dose of 1,200 of KBC. On their, re on their uh, redosing assessments, they gave 300 and 300 and gave a 400 mil warm shot. Came off all pump on low dose epi was in the ICU 12 hours and discharged home in three days. There's a picture of the incision and the finished product. The second was a 60-year-old male with mitral and tricuspid regurge. They did a minimally invasive mitral and tricuspid valve repair and a cryoblaze. This was a long case because it was technically very difficult. Almost a three-hour cross clamp, five-hour pump run. So someone asked about what do you do with KBC and long clamp time. Here's an example. 1,400 mils gave two reanimation doses of 300 and 300 to 400 mil hot shot. Just a little norepi, 13 hours in the ICU, discharged home in four days. 
So here's their total experience, the first 41 cases. Like I said, they're up to close to 300. This is their average bypass and cross clamp time, very low transfusion rate, very low inotropic rate. You want to stop and assess, does this, is this methodology effective? That should give you some clue. Again, 28% AF and not much else there to show. Here's their, here's their protocol that they use that Candace shared with them. This paper was published uh, earlier this year. Dr. Lazar is from Boston University. <clears throat> and he's been a pioneer in myocardial protection for years. Why did he pre present the paper? Because as a clinical group, surgeons and perfusionists, we have not published, we have not done the prospective randomized trials that tells us who are the best patients for single dose, what are the best procedures, and what are the technical factors that can affect the outcome or success of the case. His comments, there are several retrospective studies in isolated bypass graft and aortic valve surgery that shows that Del Nido may decrease cross clamp time and bypass times. This how ha has not resulted in any improvement in morbidity and mortality. And there is n it has not decreased red cell transfusion, intensive care, or hospital stay. How do we measure success? So far, clinical studies have been retrospective and small, okay? The role of del nido cardioplegia in myocardial protection in adult cardiac surgery is unknown because Go back to the slide two slides ago. When we talk about you read an article or you talk to someone that says they do del nido cardioplegia, which one of those eight variables do they do? And how do they do it? Not to mention patient selection or acuity. So what then is the role of del nido cardioplegia in cardiac surgery? Okay. It may result in myocardial protection that is equivalent, but not superior to multi-dose techniques. We don't have the data to support it. That's why when we make changes, when we do things differently, we need to have data. We need to document what we do. But what, here's, the, here's the, the catch. What about those patients with significant multicoronary disease with LVH in whom cardioplegic delivery may be an issue? Are those patients with reduced ejection fraction or required a long cross clamp time before more complicated procedures? Are those patients with pulmonary hypertension and right RV function? When it exceeds 60 minutes, what should the next dose be? We didn't even talk about on that slide about redosing. What's the difference in redosing? Do you redose with half strength, full strength, 200, 500? What is that? Just remember, as a important team member, recovery of post-op function is directly related to the metabolic state at the cell membrane and the subcellular level when you take the clamp off. These factors play a role in molecular changes responsible for my altered myocardial phenotype. So questions that all of us as clinicians, as patient caregivers, need to begin to answer over the next few months. Is there a difference in, in short-term post-op function between single dose and intermittent dose? Right now, most of us would tell you no, probably not. But if we haven't measured and we haven't compared apples to apples, we don't know. Is there a difference in long-term function? I certainly hope there's not because we're applying it very broadly across a whole lot of patients, and we don't know what their ventricular function is two or three years down the road. We should before we go any further. And I'll ask you again, how many of you go to ICU and see what you do, the outcome? Myocardial protection and strategies are applied in the OR, but the success of or failure is borne out in the ICU. Are you looking at their inotropes or their inotrope score? Are you looking at their troponin CKMB? 
or time in the ICU. These will give you some good clues as to whether there's your selection process is really the best or do you need to adjust, but you got to measure it. This is what we do if we come in and see you. We collect data, intraoperative data, TEE data, and then there's some postoperative data. And then we show you at the end of 94 cases. Here's your normal glucose. Most of the solutions have glucose. Blood, you got all you need. Not much transfusion, you're giving the blood. We're eliminating 11, 1200 mils of crystalloid here, Del Nido included. So, a couple of things. Not everybody does single dose. If you use an intermittent dose, microplegia is something that we're known for. And it basically, it's just taking the blood from your heart lung machine and titrating in the drugs. You control the temperature and all the other aspects. And certainly, because we have a physiological pump and you're giving blood, distribution is enhanced. You can see. Candace already showed you the difference. How do we know that distribution is enhanced? Again, this is a small study. 80 patients, Buckberg and, and microplegia, all had chest pain coming to the OR. But look at the reduction in troponin. Look at the reduction in coronary sinus lactate. Obviously, distribution was optimized with microplegia. Look here by transesophageal echo. Wall motion score was improved. Cardiac cycle efficiency improved with microplegia. Reduction in inotropes, duration of inotropes, and transfusion. That's a small patient population. But one of the other things that's very important, when you take the clamp off, you have to have ATP, energy substrates. And in these 80 patients, we looked at ATP retention. And ATP retention was much, much higher in microplegia than it was with a four to one. This is 4,000 patients. And this is not four to one, this is eight to one. And there was a significant reduction in post-operative low output syndrome. Obviously, distribution made a difference. It reduced post-op edema, buffering, and better recovery of ventricular function. And here you go. There was also an improvement in ventilatory time and post-operative stay. In today's day and world, we have to have clinical economic information. This is a study we just completed a few months ago through Premier. 211,000 patients in the in the control group, 47,000 patients in the uh, study group in 48 hospitals. When you control for with hospital variation in all covariants, we saw 5.25% overall risk reduction in, uh, my, in uh, adverse events with microplegia. How did that translate to real dollars? 13% of the patients spent one less day in the ICU. 20% were discharged a day earlier. 192 reduction in medication cost and hospital costs. So what you do, the choices that you make, this is just a small number. I think these numbers will go up as we continue to do sicker patients. Thank you. Any questions? You're all too tired at this time of the day. <laughs> to follow this, uh, just to straight down the hall, right in front of you, we have a workshop set up. We've got a pump there. And the primary person that you're going to get to see is this beautiful young lady right here. Candace will be there. If you have questions about KBC or a modified Del Nido or even microplegia, we're there and happy to um, answer your questions. Uh, there is also some libation, some crab cakes, some food, some other things there just because it's been a long day and, and uh, you might need to have a little food to get your brains working again. I'm, Thank you again. I'm going to try to summarize like one question from our webcast group here. Sure. Uh, 
you know, we've obviously been giving cardioplegia for a long time, and there's been a countless number of studies on cardioplegia. Why do we not have more agreement on, you know, what is the best way to, to deliver cardioplegia, and why is there so much variability, and how do we get to a point where we have some agreement on, <coughs> on cardioplegia? Well, I think uh, there's, that's a... That's a real complex question, but I think the big, big thing is that uh, if you look at the centers that you all trained in, those surgeons trained under someone that developed a methodology. And when surgeons leave and they go to somewhere else, quite often they take that methodology with them, right? And so in the United States, I think we have around 140 different centers. And you have all these different chiefs that come through those centers and they have evolved, their, their methodologies have evolved over a period of time. The second reason, and I think the biggest reason, is that some of you have gray hair or no hair like myself, and you've been around for a long time and you remember in the early to mid 80s there was a massive change over from crystalloid to blood cardioplegia. Since that time, and, and from then until about 1996 or 1997, you couldn't open the Annals of Thoracic Surgery or the Journal of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery without finding probably at least four or five articles on myocardial protection. Clinical articles, but the movement has been more toward the interest in changing techniques in cardiac surgery, minimally invasive surgery, techniques to repair um, the mitral valve or other things like that. And so there's not been that much research, there's not been that much interest in publishing in myocardial protection. And that's part of the reason why you don't have it. But the other part of it is, is that unlike Canada and unlike the European group, we don't have robust databases. If you have any of you guys ever looked at the STS database and seen what's there on myocardial protection? There are two boxes. Do you use crystalloid? Do you use blood? That's it. So, as a group, um, I have been an advocate for many years. I encourage you, in your particular practices, gather data. Get that information and talk about what you do and why you do it because data doesn't lie. And it, data also helps us grow. You, talk, you saw Candace. If you watched the progression of her presentation, and there's several of you else that are here that I know, the, they continue to grow and assess and make changes to improve patient outcomes. And you have to do that not only locally, but we have to do that as a group. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you.